Greetings and welcome. We are in AP English, and our objective now for the hour is to finish our conversations uh, regarding T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. The uh, final two offerings of the four we'll now listen to. Again, we are paying particular attention to the lines that for us move us so that we're prepared to uh, write uh, our paper here coming uh, next week. The Dry South Ages. I do not know much about gods, but I think that the river is a strong brown god, sullen, untamed, and intractable, patient to some degree, at first recognized as a frontier, useful, untrustworthy as a conveyor of commerce, then only a problem confronting the builder of bridges. The problem once solved, the brown god is almost forgotten by the dwellers in cities, ever, however, implacable, keeping his seasons and rages, destroyer, reminder of what men choose to forget. Unhonored, unpropitiated by worshippers of the machine, but waiting, watching and waiting. His rhythm was present in the nursery bedroom, in the rank Atlantis of the April dooryard, in the smell of grapes on the autumn table and the evening circle in the winter gaslight. The river is within us. The sea is all about us. The sea is the land's edge also, the granite into which it reaches, the beaches where it tosses its hints of earlier and other creation. The starfish, the horseshoe crab, the whale's backbone, the pools where it offers to our curiosity the more delicate algae and the sea anemone. It tosses up our losses, the torn same, the shattered lobster pot, the broken oar, and the gear of foreign dead men. The sea has many voices, many gods and many voices. The salt is on the briar rose, the bog is in the fir trees. The sea howl and the sea yelp are different voices, often together heard. The whine in the rigging, the menace and caress of wave that breaks on water, the distant rote in the granite teeth, and the wailing warning from the approaching headland are all sea voices, and the heaving groaner rounded homewards, and the seagull, and under the oppression of the silent fog, the tolling bell measures time, not our time, rung by the unhurried ground swell, a time older than the time of chronometers, older than time counted by anxious, worried women, lying awake, calculating the future, trying to unweave, unwind, unravel, and piece together the past and the future, between midnight and dawn, when the past is all deception, the future futureless, before the morning watch, when time stops and time is never ending, and the ground swell that is and was from the beginning clangs the bell. Where is there an end of it, the soundless wailing, the silent withering of autumn flowers, dropping their petals and remaining motionless? Where is there an end to the drifting wreckage, the prayer of the bone on the beach, the unprayable prayer of the calamitous annunciation. There is no end but addition, the trailing consequence of further days and hours, while emotion takes to itself the emotionless years of living among the breakage of what was believed in as the most reliable and therefore the fittest for renunciation. There is the final addition, the failing pride or resentment at failing powers, the unattached devotion which might pass for devotionless, in a drifting boat with a slow leakage, the silent listening to the undeniable clamor of the bell of the last denunciation. Where is the end of them? 
the fisherman sailing into the wind's tail, where the fog covers us. He cannot think of a time that is oceanless, or of an ocean not littered with wastage, or of a future that is not liable like the past to have no destination. We have to think of them as forever bailing, setting and falling while the northeast flowers, over shallow banks unchanging and erosionless, or drawing their money, drying sails at dockage, not as making a trip that will be unpayable, or a haul that will not bear examination. There is no end of it, the voiceless wailing, no end to the withering of withered flowers, to the movement of pain that is painless and motionless, to the drift of the sea and the drifting wreckage, the bones prayer to death its God. Only the hardly, barely prayable prayer of the one annunciation. It seems, as one becomes older, that the past has another pattern and ceases to be a mere sequence or even development, the latter a partial fallacy, encouraged by superficial notions of evolution, which becomes, in the popular mind, a means of disowning the past. The moments of happiness, not the sense of well-being, fruition, fulfillment, security or affection, or even a very good dinner, but the sudden illumination we had the experience but missed the meaning, and approach to the meaning restores the experience in a different form, beyond any meaning we can assign to happiness. I have said before that the past experience revived in the meaning is not the experience of one life only, but of many generations. Not forgetting something that is probably quite ineffable, the backward look behind the assurance of recorded history, the backward half look over the shoulder toward the primitive terror. Now, we come to discover that the moments of agony, whether or not due to misunderstanding, having hoped for the wrong things or dreaded the wrong things is not in question, are likewise permanent, with such permanence as time has. We appreciate this better in the agony of others nearly experienced, involving ourselves, than in our own. For our own past is covered by the currents of action, but the torment of others remains an experience unqualified, unworn by subsequent attrition. People change and smile, but the agony abides. Time the destroyer is time the preserver, like the river with its cargo of dead negroes, cows, and chicken coops, the bitter apple and the bite in the apple, and the ragged rock in the restless waters, waves wash over it, bogs conceal it. On a halcyon day, it is merely a monument. In navigable weather, it is always a sea mark to lay a course by. But in the somber season, or the sudden fury, is what it always was. I sometimes wonder if that is what Krishna meant, among other things, or one way of putting the same thing, that the future is a faded song, a royal rose or a lavender spray of wistful regret for those who are not yet here to regret, pressed between yellow leaves of a book that has never been opened. And the way up is the way down, the way forward is the way back. You cannot face it steadily, but this thing is sure, that time is no healer, the patient is no longer here. When the train starts, and the passengers are settled to fruit periodicals and business letters, and those who saw them off have left the platform, their faces relaxed from grief into relief to the sleepy rhythm of a hundred hours. They are forward travelers not escaping from the past into different lives or into any future. You are not the same people who left that station or who will arrive at any terminus while the narrowing rails slide together behind you. And on the deck of the drumming liner, 
watching the furrow that widens behind you, you shall not think the past is finished or the future is before us. At nightfall, in the rigging and the aerial, is a voice descanting, though not to the ear the murmuring shell of time, and not in any language. Bear forward, you who think that you are voyaging. You are not those who saw the harbour receding, or those who will disembark. Here, between the hither and the farther shore, while time is withdrawn, consider the future and the past with an equal mind. At the moment which is not of action or inaction, you can receive this. On whatever sphere of being the mind of a man may be intent at the time of death, that is the one action, and the time of death is every moment, which shall fructify in the lives of others, and do not think of the fruit of action. Bear forward. O voyagers, O seamen, you who come to port and you whose bodies will suffer the trial and judgment of the sea, or whatever event, this is your real destination. So Krishna, as when he admonished Arjuna on the field of battle, not fare well, but fare forward, voyagers. Lady, whose shrine stands on the promontory, Pray for all those who are in ships, those whose business has to do with fish, and those concerned with every lawful traffic, and those who conduct them. Repeat a prayer also on behalf of women who have seen their sons or husbands setting forth and not returning. Filia del tuo filio, queen of heaven. Also pray for those who were in ships and ended their voyage on the sand, in the sea slips, or in the dark throat which will not reject them, or wherever cannot reach them the sound of the sea bells, perpetual Angelus. To communicate with Mars, converse with spirits, to report the behavior of the sea monster, describe the horoscope, eraspicate or scribe, observe disease in signatures, evoke biography from the wrinkles of the palm and tragedy from fingers, release omens by sortilage or tea leaves, riddle the inevitable with playing cards, fiddle with pentagrams or barbituric acids, or dissect the recurrent image into pre-conscious terrors to explore the womb or tomb or dream. All these are usual pastimes and drugs and features of the press, and always will be, some of them especially, when there is distress of nations and perplexity, whether on the shores of Asia or in the Edgware Road. Men's curiosity searches past and future and clings to that dimension. But to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time, is an occupation for the saint. No occupation either, but something given and taken. In a lifetime's death in love, ardor and selflessness and self-surrender for most of us. There is only the unattended moment, the moment in and out of time, the distraction fit, lost in a shaft of sunlight. The wild time unseen, or the winter lightning, or the waterfall, or music heard so deeply that it is not heard at all, but you are the music while the music lasts. These are only hints and guesses, hints followed by guesses, and the rest is prayer, observance, discipline, thought, and action. The hint half guessed, the gift half understood, is incarnation. Here the impossible union of spheres of existence is actual. Here the past and future are conquered and reconciled. Where action, where otherwise movement, of that which is only moved, and has in it no source of movement, driven by demonic, thonic powers, and right action is freedom from past and future also. For most of us, this is the aim never here to be realized. 
who are only undefeated because we have gone on trying. We, content at the last, if our temporal reversion nourish not too far from the yew tree, the life of significant soil. Little Gidding. Midwinter spring is its own season, sempiternal though sodden towards sundown, suspended in time between pole and tropic. When the short day is brightest with frost and fire, the brief sun flames the ice on pond and ditches in windless cold that is the heart's heat, reflecting in a watery mirror a glare that is blindness in the early afternoon, and glow more intense than blaze of branch or brazier stirs the dumb spirit. No wind but Pentecostal fire in the dark time of the year. Between melting and freezing, the soul's sap quivers. There is no earth smell or smell of living thing. This is the springtime but not in time's covenant. Now the hedgerow is blanched for an hour with transitory blossom of snow, a bloom more sudden than that of summer, neither budding nor fading, not in the scheme of generation. Where is the summer, the unimaginable zero summer? If you came this way, taking the route you would be likely to take, from the place you would be likely to come from. If you came this way in May time, you would find the hedges white again in May with voluptuary sweetness. It would be the same at the end of the journey if you came at night like a broken king, if you came by day not knowing what you came for. It would be the same when you leave the rough road and turn behind the pigsty to the dull facade and the tombstone. And what you thought you came for is only a shell, a husk of meaning, from which the purpose breaks only when it is fulfilled, if at all. Either you had no purpose, or the purpose is beyond the end you figured and is altered in fulfillment. There are other places which also are the world's end some at the sea jaws, or over a dark lake, in a desert, or a city. But this is the nearest in place and time, now and in England. If you came this way, taking any route, starting from anywhere, at any time or at any season, it would always be the same. You would have to put off sense and notion. You are not here to verify, instruct yourself, or inform curiosity or carry a report. You are here to kneel where prayer has been valid. And prayer is more than an order of words, the conscious occupation of the praying mind, or the sound of the voice praying. And what the dead had no speech for when living, they can tell you being dead. The communication of the dead is tongue with fire beyond the language of the living. Here, the intersection of the timeless moment is England and nowhere, never and always. Ash on an old man's sleeve is all the ash the burnt roses leave. Dust in the air suspended marks the place where a story ended. Dust in breathed was a house, the wall, the wainscot, and the mouse. The death of hope and despair, this is the death of air. There are flood and drought over the eyes and in the mouth, dead water and dead sand contending for the upper hand. The parched, eviscerate soil gapes at the vanity of toil, laughs without mirth. This is the death of earth. Water and fire succeed the town, the pasture, and the weed. Water and fire deride the sacrifice that we deny. Water and fire shall rot the marred foundations we forgot of sanctuary and choir. 
This is the death of water and fire. In the uncertain hour before the morning, near the ending of interminable night, after the current end of the unending, after the dark dove with the flickering tongue had passed below the horizon of his homing, while the dead leaves still rattled on like tin over the asphalt where no other sound was, between three districts whence the smoke arose, I met one walking, loitering and hurried as if blown toward me like the metal leaves before the urban dawn wind, unresisting. And as I fixed upon the downturned face, that pointed scrutiny with which we challenged the first met stranger in the waning dusk, I caught the sudden look of some dead master whom I had known, forgotten, half recalled, both one and many, in the brown baked features, the eyes of a familiar compound ghost, both intimate and unidentifiable. So I assumed a double part and cried and heard another's voice cry, what are you here? Although we were not, I was still the same, knowing myself yet being someone other and he a face still forming Yet the words sufficed to compel the recognition they preceded. And so, compliant to the common wind, too strange to each other for misunderstanding, in concord at this intersection time of meeting nowhere, no before and after, we trod the pavement in a dead patrol. I said, the wonder that I feel is easy Yet ease is cause of wonder, therefore speak. I may not comprehend, may not remember. And he, I am not eager to rehearse my thought and theory which you have forgotten. These things have served their purpose, let them be. So with your own, and pray they be forgiven by others, as I pray you to forgive both bad and good. Last season's fruit is eaten, and the full-fed beast shall kick the empty pail. For last year's words belong to last year's language, and next year's words await another voice. But, as the passage now presents no hindrance, to the spirit unappeased and peregrine, between two worlds become much like each other. So I find words I never thought to speak, in streets I never thought I should revisit when I left my body on a distant shore. Since our concern was speech, and speech impelled us to purify the dialect of the tribe and urge the mind to aftersight and foresight, let me disclose the gifts reserved for aid to set a crown upon your lifetime's effort. First, the cold friction of expiring sense without enchantment, offering no promise but bitter tastelessness of shadow fruit as body and soul begin to fall asunder. Second, the conscious impotence of rage at human folly and the laceration of laughter at what ceases to amuse. And last, the rending pain of reenactment of all that you have done and been, the shame of motives late revealed, and the awareness of things ill done and done to others' harm, which once you took for exercise of virtue. Then fool's approval stings and honor stains. From wrong to wrong, the exasperated spirit proceeds, unless restored by that refining fire where you must move in measure like a dancer. The day was breaking. In the disfigured street, he left me with a kind of valediction and faded on the blowing of the horn. 
There are three conditions which often look alike, yet differ completely, flourish in the same hedgerow. Attachment to self and to things and to persons, detachment from self and from things and from persons, and growing between them indifference, which resembles the others as death resembles life, being between two lives, unflowering between the live and the dead metal. This is the use of memory for liberation, not less of love, but expanding of love beyond desire, and so liberation from the future as well as the past. Thus, love of a country begins as attachment to our own field of action, and comes to find that action of little importance, though never indifferent. History may be servitude, history may be freedom, See, now they vanish, the bases and places, with the self which, as it could, loved them, to become renewed, transfigured, in another pattern. Sin is behoofly, but all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. If I think again of this place, and of people not wholly commendable, of no immediate kin or kindness, but some of peculiar genius, all touched by a common genius, united in the strife which divided them. If I think of a king at nightfall, of three men and more on the scaffold, and a few who died forgotten in other places, here and abroad, and of one who died blind and quiet, why should we celebrate these dead men more than the dying? It is not to ring the bell backward, nor is it an incantation to summon the spectre of a rose. We cannot revive old factions, we cannot restore old policies, or follow an antique drum. These men, and those who opposed them, and those whom they opposed, accept the constitution of silence, and are folded in a single party. Whatever we inherit from the fortunate, we have taken from the defeated what they had to leave us, a symbol, a symbol perfected in death. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, by the purification of the motive in the ground of our beseeching. The dove descending breaks the air with flame of incandescent terror, of which the tongues declare the one discharge from sin and error. The only hope or else despair lies in the choice of fire or power, to be redeemed from fire by fire. Who then devised the torment? Love. Love is the unfamiliar name behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of flame which human power cannot remove. We only live, only suspire, consumed by either fire or fire. What we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And every phrase and sentence that is right, where every word is at home, taking its place to support the others, the word neither diffident nor ostentatious, an easy commerce of the old and the new, the common word exact without vulgarity, the formal word precise but not pedantic, the complete consort dancing together. Every phrase and every sentence is an end and a beginning, every poem an epitaph. And any action is a step to the block, to the fire, down the sea's throat, or to an illegible stone, and that is where we start. We die with the dying, see they depart, and we go with them. We are born with the dead, 
see they return and bring us with them. The moment of the rose and the moment of the yew tree are of equal duration. A people without history is not redeemed from time, for history is a pattern of timeless moments. So, while the light fails on a winter's afternoon in a secluded chapel, history is now and England. With the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick now, here now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. When the touch